in charge of tending to to sheep. So he takes all the sheep out to the to the you know the mountainside and the sheep are grazing and whatnot. And then this boy, you know, there's like a little pond there. So the boy leaves the sheep and he goes uh, swimming. So he's having fun, he's enjoying himself, and while he's swimming, a wolf comes. And it doesn't eat one of the sheep, it like eats one sheep, and it eats the second one, the third one it has, like the biggest buffet it ever had in its life. It eats the entire flock. And so he finishes swimming, he, uh, you know, dries himself off, gets up, and he sees the entire flock is wiped out. And he said, the hasra is this boy going back to his master to tell him what had happened, saying that he's, he's lost the entire flock. And you'll see that in, in war times, for example, someone going in with a, you know, a battalion of um, airplanes, going in with, you know, 17, 20 airplanes, and having their entire group be killed and only like the general coming back and the sadness people would retire after that after they've lost so many people the hasra and this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying anta qula nafsun ya hasra the person will come back on the day of judgment ya hasrata he'll, this is what he'll have but of course that'll be the day of judgment just to give you like a little glimpse of uh, what it's like a very tiny glimpse to come back on that day without preparing the proper good deeds Yahya ibn Mu'ad rahimahullah ta'ala he says that the most naive thing in my eyes is to linger in sin with no regrets hoping for a far off pardon you know naive you know what the word naive means ignorant not necessarily ignorant naive like if I told you I'll sell you a bridge in Brooklyn for fifty dollars huh gullible. gullible naive and you'll be like fifty dollars right <laughs> that's a great deal here it is you know you put it in like okay thanks and then I'm gone and then you go to New York to pick up your bridge and it's not there alright naive he's saying that someone like dumb like this is someone who wants to continue doing sins and he just hopes that later on in life he uh, he's just gonna be forgiven by Allah he doesn't care like he's just going through life doing his stuff doing whatever he wants and that one day Allah is just gonna forgive him for everything and everything will be happy he says that's the most naive person in my life the most gullible, the dumbest person is this guy. And don't use that word for other people. And then he said, and to hope, the naive person, the gullible person, is to hope to come closer to Allah without doing anything. To think that you're going to come closer to Allah and that your Iman is going to just zoom up by doing nothing. It's just going to miraculously just fall down upon you, bang you in the head. And then to await the harvest of Jannah with the seeds of hellfire like he's planting seeds of hellfire his entire life and then when he dies he's hoping to go to Jannah waiting for reward reward without doing any good deeds and subhanAllah sometimes I don't know if you've heard of uh, the ruling and there's a lot of scholars here but there's a difference of opinion ab amongst the scholars that is someone who doesn't pray are they Muslim or not there's a difference among the scholars a very deep like difference of opinion. Some of the scholars say that if someone doesn't pray, they're not Muslim anymore. If they have the five salah, Fajr, Duhar, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, if they stop praying, they're not Muslim. And I said there's difference of opinion. Other people say that they're still Muslim, but they're just lazy Muslims and they're in big trouble, but they're still Muslim. Other people say that they should be treated like kuffar. They should be treated like kuffar, and they took it to the point where they say that they should even be buried in the cemetery of the kuffar because they, they died like this for not praying and it's a very serious issue I, I remember asking a sheikh uh, and I studied in Medina University and or I didn't ask him sorry someone else asked him they said that you know my father you know he passed away and I'd like to do Hajj for him this year can I do Hajj for him knowing that he never used to pray he never did his Salah and the, and the sheikh said and in, these are like from the oldest shiuch in, in Medina he said, you don't have to do Hajj for him. If he didn't pray, there's no Hajj for him because he died a non-Muslim. That's serious. Right, I'm thinking, where am I going? <laughs> okay, so 
with that ruling, subhanAllah, there was a, another older lady that she's asking about, you know, her husband. She wants to do uh, Hajj for him also. And then this issue came up. She said he never used to pray. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, like, we think that we can just live our lives doing anything we want. And when someone dies, we can just make a good, you know, lecture and recite Quran. And subhanAllah, you'll see people that don't normally come to the masjid, like at their funeral. Kind of like the people that come to the funeral. I remember, subhanAllah, in, uh, in Washington, D.C., there's a sister that passed away. And they said there's going to be janazah at, at Dhuhr time. And I'm like, fine. I wasn't, like, dressed properly. I was, like, working at the school, and it was summertime. And then I was shocked. When Dhuhr time came, um, you, you had, like, Sheikh Jafar Adri, Sheikh al Fawzan, All these scholars were there, and the masjid was packed as if it was, like, a Jummah prayer. You know, and I'm basically wearing my pajamas because uh, we're working in the school in the summer. And I was like, what's going on here? You know, and there was a huge crowd for this sister. And Sheikh Fawzan gave a lecture. I don't think Sheikh Fawzan is here. Um, and then they took her to the janazah. And even her non-Muslim relatives who were sitting in the back, they said that when we die, we want to be buried like this too. And they're non-Muslim. And the reason they were saying, I asked her, like, who was this lady and how did she evoke such strong emotions from everybody? They said that she was, like, one of the one of the strongest Muslims in Washington, D.C. And she started practicing, like, Quran and Sunnah, you know, from 20, 30 years ago. And she was one of the key people to bring the proper understanding of Quran and Sunnah to many of the people in the Washington, D.C. area, inside, inside the D.C. area. And a lot of the people actually learned and studied or came closer to the correct deen through her and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed her you know you can see that in her um, in her death there was um, there's a poetry line actually do you guys like poetry? No, not that much music is poetry right? they try putting the songs together but anyhow there's a, a poetry line that says Tarjun najata wa lam tasluk masalikuha which means that that you hope to be forgiven you hope for redemption but you haven't traveled the path of that redemption you haven't traveled that path of that forgiveness boats don't travel in the desert and you have to take your boat and you have to put it in the proper water for it to get to its destination subhanAllah I was <coughs> I, said, I gave this lecture like a long time ago and Remember in the beginning, for those who are here, we, we had a little activity where we were thinking, putting ourselves into the seat of someone who's actually got into a car accident this morning on the way to Mr. Noor's uh, conference, and what kind of things they would see, hear, and feel in the ambulance. And so we talk about these things. SubhanAllah, Allah gave me a taste of this. And it was actually September 11th, the week right after September 11th, um, September 18th on a Tuesday at like about 12 in the afternoon I was leaving the school and I, I went to do um, some supply shopping for my classes and subhanAllah in a, in a split second you know my life could have been over I was crossing an intersection there's a very um, busy like highway kind of going through our this town and I was crossing the intersection going across like this like eight lanes and they actually have like speed bumps for people that are coming down this hill because they're coming in at very high speeds. So all I remember is my eyes turning like this as I was crossing. And I thought to myself, like, am I going through the red light? And then I'm in the hospital. You know, just like that, in a second. And, and even that, that thing about the red light, I actually had to remember that afterwards. Maybe, you know, the next day I was remembering what had actually happened. What had happened was this this lady had was a female driver. She had gone through uh, the red light at a very high speed, very at maybe 60 miles an hour, at least. And all, actually, all she did was hit the back of the car, swerved, hit the back of my car. But that bump in the car it ignited the airbags. Right? In Arab countries, you don't have airbags unless you have like the newer cars. And I would have been dead by now if I was in Medina or something. The airbag came out. The airbag comes out so swiftly that it'll not, it, it knocked me unconscious. So the airbag went wham, hit me in the head, and, and I fell into concussion. 
but the car is still moving forward right so I'm unconscious and the car is moving forward the car swerves out hits another car and then goes like kinda like off a little cliff and slams into a pole my car so the actually the, the, the front of the car came all the way to the windshield right so the entire front of the car and it was destroyed the car uh, but alhamdulillah it hit on the on the passenger side not on the driver's side so I got cut in the leg and unconscious right and like I said about the blood I actually I was talking about myself when I said it because I had blood on my clothes and and, I, and I'm like I felt okay but when you see your cl you know your clothes drenched in blood you're like something must have happened and subhanallah all I remember is you know no I need to go back to school they're waiting for me to have a class I have to teach and the, and the police officer's talking to me and he's saying you know just like you see in the movies the, the final scene when the guy's going in and you know the lights of the uh, the hospital are, are going on top of you and the doctor saying you know you're really lucky you had your seatbelt on subhanallah I put the seatbelt on maybe five seconds before the accident because I'm in the habit and it's not a good habit and I've learned my lesson now of starting the car and, and driving like suppose I get in the car here I'll drive and then when I get to the first red light that's when I'll put the seatbelt on you guys have that habit or you guys don't drive yet right yeah you know because you're, you're bored so you're waiting at the red light that's when you put your seatbelt on so I was at the red light I had left the parking lot went to a red light and at the red light put the seatbelt on and then I crossed and then and then was hit like this and then I thought to myself the doctor was talking or sorry the police officer was talking to him and I couldn't reply to him I could hear him and I, I remember hearing him but I couldn't say anything to him and I felt what it's like you know firsthand what it's like to not have control of what you say in those final moments you don't have control over what you say. It's impossible to, like, say, oh, say la ilaha illallah, and then you're like, okay, now I'll go to Jannah. Let me just say la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and everything's all happy and fine. If if everything you say at that moment comes from your heart, you can't say anything off the top of your head, and and you can't use your your brain to make, you know, um, use logic. It comes uh, unconsciously. If you lived la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, in your life it'll come out at that time it'll come out and similarly if you fill your lives with things that, that take you away from that la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah when that moment comes then you might not you might be fooled in those days and like we said you never know when that's going to happen so continuing from that um, I'll finish off the story for you of that um, the police officer so the first one wasn't a good ending this next one, he said, the police officer that we mentioned earlier fell back into routine, as he narrates, and started to drift away from Allah. So even though he's a police officer, he sees people dying every day, he's still not, not practicing until something happened. He said, but another event happened to him that sealed his return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he continues. He says, what an odd world. After some time, about six months, a strange accident took place. A young man was moving along the highway normally, but within one of the tunnels leading to the city, he was maimed by a flat tire. And so, if you ever been to Saudi Arabia, they get these big caprice. You know, you know, a capri you know what a caprice is? We don't have too many of them. They're American cars, but they sell them to the Saudis. Huh? Like police cars, yeah. Those, those, you know, the big fat cars, and they're and they're in Saudi. They drive them like 100 miles an hour, and there's no cops, and they just drive them everywhere. So this guy, he gets a flat tire in a tunnel. There's no like side road or anything. So he's in the middle of the tunnel and he's trying to fix his flat tire. And then another car, one of these caprices, comes coming in at 100 miles an hour while he's fixing the tire. So he's like in getting open up, opening the trunk up to get his tire out and fixing it. And this car comes and pounds him from the back. Okay. A young man was moving uh, along the, okay, f by the flat tire. To the side of the tunnel, he parked and stepped to the back to remove the spare tire. The whistle of a speeding car from behind. In a second, it collided with the crippled car, the young man in between the two of them. He fell to the ground with critical injuries. I rushed to the scene, myself and another partner other than the first one. Together, we carried the young man's body into our patrol car and phoned the hospital to prepare for his arrival. He was a young adult in his blossom years, kind of like your ages. 
You guys try. 16 years old. Not yet. Okay, be careful. Religious, you could tell from his ex from his appearance. He was mumbling when we carried him, but in our rush, we paid no attention to what he was saying. However, when we placed him on his back in the pat patrol car, and like they, they drove off, we could make it out, like what he was saying. Through the pain, his heart was reciting Quran. He was so immersed in the recitation, SubhanAllah, you would never have said that this person was in tense pain. So this boy is in critical condition. He's in the, in the, you know, the stretcher, and he's going to his death. And the words that are coming from his heart are the surahs that he memorized. So he's reciting. Blood has soaked his clothes crimson red. His bones had clearly snapped in several places. And to tell the truth, he looked like he was staring into the eyes of death. He continued to read in his unique, tender voice, <coughs> reciting every verse in proper rhythm. In my entire life, I had never heard any recitation like it. I said to myself, I'm going to instruct him to say the Shahada just like I saw my friend doing, especially since I had previous experience. My partner and I listened to that intently to that soft voice. I felt the shiver shock my back and up my arm and the hair stood. Suddenly the hymn ceased. I watched silently, so he turns around into the car and looks at the boy. As his hand rose softly. So the boy is in critical condition. He's now raising his hand. He doesn't need anybody to tell him to say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. He had his index finger pointed upward to the heavens saying the shahada La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Then his head slumped and nothing. I jumped to the back seat, felt his hand, his heart, his breathing. He was dead. I couldn't stop staring at him. A, f a tear fell but I hid it in shame. I turned back to my partner and told him that the boy's life had ceased and he burst out loud crying. Seeing a man cry like that, I could not control myself and my partner faded away behind the fall of my own tears. The patrol car fogged from the emotions. We arrived at the hospital and as we rushed through the corridors, we told all the doctors, nurses and onlookers what had happened. So many people were affected by what we said that some stood there spe speechless and tearful. No one wanted to lose sight of the boy that had been assured of the time and place he would be buried, until they were assured of the time and place he would be buried. One of the hospital staff phoned the boy's home to tell them that the boy was dead. His brother picked it up and was told of the accident. His brother told us about him, and he said, this is his brother speaking about him, he used to go out every Monday to visit his only grandmother outside of town. Whenever he visited her, he made sure to spend time with the poor, poor children idling the streets and the orphans. The town knew him. He was the one that would bring them the Islamic books and tapes. His dusty Mazda would be filled with r rice and sugar and even candies. Couldn't forget the candies for those families who were in need. He would not stand for anyone to discourage him from the long journey to that town. He would always politely reply that the long t drive gave him time to review his Quran and listen to Islamic lectures on his cassette deck and that with every step to the town he hoped for the reward that he would find with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran وَإِنِّي لَغَفَّارٌ لِمَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا ثُمَّ اهْتَدَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَإِنِّي لَغَفَّارٌ that not only is Allah forgiving, Allah is off forgiving like someone who does something repeatedly. Have you ever heard of someone named Najjar? Najjar? Right? The, it's a kind of a statement, like a butcher, someone who's always slaughtering meat. It's the same like wording in Arabic, Ghaffar, is someone who's always forgiving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ghaffar. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, To who? Liman tab. Wa inni la ghaffarun liman taba. I'm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving for those people who ask for forgiveness. Those people actually try coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Liman taba wa amana and believe wa amila salihan and do good deeds. Thumma And then they're guided after that. Those are the people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help. And in fact, when you make the intention to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will make that easy for you. Just like you've heard in the hadith that when the person, you know, puts his hand out to Allah, Allah puts his arm out. When the person comes walking to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes running to them. So you'll see the person tries just a little bit 
to come closer to Allah and things will open up for the person. Okay, there's a there's a joke. I'm gonna tell you a joke. Allah, you wanna hear a joke? It's not the time. <laughs> okay. <coughs> there's a joke. And this is a joke that the Christians say. So I'm gonna modify it a little bit for this audience. Um, <clears throat> there's a flood in a town. Many times it happens in uh, North Dakota. We get floods up there. I'm from Winnipeg, actually, Manitoba. It's above North Dakota. So it's in North Dakota. You know the floods, and the police have asked everybody to evacuate the city. So there's a there's a priest, and he he won't evacuate because he knows God will save him. All right, so so they, someone drives by and they're like, "Priest, get in the car! Come on! You know the the floods are coming. You're gonna drown." He goes, "No, no, God will save me." And then they're like, "Okay," and they leave him. So then, you know, the flood waters are, are getting pretty deep, and it gets get, getting deeper and deeper. So the priest is like swimming in the water. All right, he's swimming and he's waddling around, and so these you know people come by with canoe. And they and they're like, "Can I come on, Reverend? Get in, get in the the canoe. You know, we'll save you and stuff." And he says, "No, no, God will save me." All right, and as just go, God, God will save me. I don't need your help. So he's swimming in this. He finds like um, you know, the water's getting deeper and deeper. He finds like a hill, climbs up the hill, and the water's like filling. He's just right at the end. He's on the top of the highest place. The water's about to fill him. So they bring in a helicopter. They see him stranded. They like put down the the rope. And then they tell him, you know, come on, Reverend, get on, get in the row. We'll save you. And it's his last breath, and he said, No, no, go. God will save me. Leave me. So they're like, Okay. So the air helicopter uh, flies away, and of course the water finishes him off, and he's dead. Right? He died. That's not the joke. <laughs> so then he goes back. The angels are like, you know. The angels are talking to him, and then and then this guy goes, you know, why didn't you save me? Why wasn't I saved? And he wants to know what went wrong. And then the angel said, we sent you the people in the car, we sent you the people in the canoe, we sent you the helicopter. <laughs> What's your problem? You know. So this is what they they tell someone. Subhanallah. As a Muslim, <clears throat> a lot of people they think that you know their savior is just going to come come slamming down upon them. Um, and and when we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide us, what are we actually thinking of? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sent the books. You'll see the Qur'ans are right there. Right? They're abandoned. Right there. We didn't even notice that they were sitting there. Allah sent them. And Allah sent the warners and the glad tiders. You have, I think, you know, how many shuyukh are here today? Maybe 20 of them. Telling people what to do. Again and again. So when we hear something's haram, we've actually heard it many, many times. So the people come, the prophets came. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophet after prophet. So these, this is our car and our canoe and our helicopter. And in fact, every night Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down. In the third portion of the night, as the Prophet sallam said, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls out to everybody, Hal min da'in fa Is there anybody who will make dua so that I'll answer their dua? Hal min mustaghfirin fa Is there anybody who will ask forgiveness? So that I'll forgive them But it's us that have abandoned it And actually we're laughing at the priest But we need to protect ourselves from not falling into that position Because the warnings have come And actually when you look at it You know when you have like a big exam coming up The teacher keeps warning It's going to be hard, it's going to be hard But you decide, no I'm going to leave it to the last moment And I'm going to you know, cram for this exam And right at the last moment you try studying But it's just that night you're just too tired You have to sleep, you come in the exam It's too hard you fail can you really go back to the teacher and complain that you didn't tell me that the exam was hard you can't go back you failed and you know or that person's failed and they can only blame themselves and they have the hustle and so on the day of judgment when that death comes because like I said it'll come in a snap you could be crossing you could just be coming out of you know this section some sister will come bang your car the airbags will go off and you know like you see in the movies the gasoline will start trickling and then the car explodes and you're dead and, and it'll be in like all the newspapers you know accident and masjid and nur 
nobody really knows who you are and then you're gone and then you'll think like oh but I thought I would be living for 60 years you know I was planning later on to become a good Muslim I wasn't planning today actually I wasn't even planning in this lecture when you're listening to me are you thinking like yeah when I go to university I'm gonna be a good Muslim <laughs> when I when I get married am I gonna be a Muslim are you thinking I need to change right now I need to change here right now and, and don't think that you know I'm just giving it to you even when I give these lectures subhanAllah like the tapes sometimes I'll just sit back and, and listen to myself not you know telling you that the tapes finished but I'll <coughs> I'll take the tape and I'll listen to it and like you know I become like a different person and stuff and I'll listen to the tape just like you're listening to the lecture and I'll think did I really say that and then I said man I, I need to be practicing some of the, these things you know because it's it's a uh, like when we talk about Islam everything's like so perfect because Islam is, is a perfect but even us we need to work on it so inshallah ta'ala the key is to make the intention if you're going to you're thinking how am I going to come closer back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before my time comes then finish at 11.30 11.30 number one is make it small something that you're capable of think of one thing that's standing between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so think of that thing you thought of something standing between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it actually might be something very dear to you, quote unquote dear, but it might be something that you're doing that you know is not right. Alright, everybody's got that thing in their mind. You've got it. And I got mine. Alright, then you think that if it's just one thing that I'm going to try and change in my life, that let it be this. And when you think you, to yourself, you're like, man, how am I going to stop doing this? It's actually very hard for me to stop. And when you think like that, you're thinking like that because because you think it's you that are trying like um you're trying or sorry the word is you're trying to put it all on your back right someone's doing something haram is like i want to change it but i'm too weak allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al qawi is is uh the powerful one and so don't think that it's you that's going to change by yourself ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you change because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power to change your emotions and so if you're doing something haram and you know it's haram but you you know you enjoy it it's dear to you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you hate this from the bottom of your heart make you hate it so someone here at uh, last year's lecture I gave it, you were here and I was talking about okay the the television set okay there might be other haram things but subhanAllah the television set I, I hate it from the bottom of my heart I hate it with a passion and and uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking about you know actually movies might be different <laughs> Allah, I'm, and I'm not talking about those things but specifically when I see a television set I get very angry of the of the way that it like corrupts someone's mind and it corrupts um, this so actually if I go to a hotel room first thing I do is go and unplug the television set you know to have it in the room that big one eyed the jet sitting there in front of me and then I, I'll go and unplug it so that I won't feel the urge to grab the remote control and say oh let me just watch 15 which turns into three hours right even though someone may hate it it's because they draw the attention subhanAllah we took the um, we had a sleepover in our masjid with the with the boys in our school and they're like they're at the camp or the sleepover and they're like we gotta watch the NBA game you know it's the finals you have to watch it they're like if you wanted to watch it you shouldn't have come to the camp you could stay home you know get make your popcorn and sit and lounge in front of the TV set and actually pretend like you're actually doing sports you know so they're like okay okay we don't want to watch it and stuff like that and one of them had actually brought an antenna to the masjid so that they could hook it up to one of these one of these uh, sisters TV sets so they could watch the game so then we, we took them bowling Right, and we walked into the bowling uh, area, and there was a TV set on in the in the bowling area. They, I don't think there's a magnet this powerful, but the entire group, maybe like 12 brothers, 
they swarmed to the television set. All of them. So like this is like the eye right here. Here's the camera eye. They all went vroom. They all came to it, you know, like zombies. And, and I actually, here's the TV set was up on the screen. I stood in front of the TV set looking at their faces. <laughs> Someone want to make a, a TV face? What does a TV face look like? I want to make one. You look pretty weird if you do it. Go ahead, but I'll try. What does your face look like when you make a TV face? TV face. We can get a camera and make a competition. Who can make the best TV face? You want to try? It's usually, you know, wa you know, the spit drooling from your mouth. You keep the muscles in your in your in your cheeks relax. Your face relaxes, and you just you become uh, a vegetable when when you look at it. I don't want to do it because the camera's on right now. It's probably being recorded, but uh, I'm sure you understand. So all these kids had zombie faces. I was going like this to hello. Hello, you know, and the TV is like on top of me. But subhanAllah, that the kind of uh, you know drug that that TV set is doing. Subhanallah, when when someone opens a book, they're like, I want to open my mind. I want to learn something. And then when they want to relax, quote unquote, relax their brain muscles, they turn on the television set, right? Like, oh, that was a hard exam. Let me watch TV. They've now relaxed their muscles. What happens when you relax your mu muscles? It becomes flabby and it becomes like a worthless muscle. So actually what that TV does to the person it turns into a flabby worthless muscle. So you need to strengthen your brain muscles to do brain push-ups stuff. Open up a book. Do something more. Anyways. <coughs> There's some other stuff I had but inshallah if anybody had any questions you can talk about it. Questions, comments. It's very easy on these kind of lectures because nobody differs about death. If I talked about music and singing, if I talked about you know other things, okay, there's questions and whatnot. But when you talk about death, everybody knows you're gonna die. Whether they're Christian, Jew, Muslim, everybody knows that you're gonna die. When we were studying in, in Medina, when we were studying in Medina, we were always studying like scholar the difference of opinion among scholars until we came to the book of funeral prayers in the Islamic jurisprudence. And the Sheikh always he started off that class. He said. Al mawtu la khilafafi. He said, death, there's no difference of opinion. Everybody knows that we're going to die. So maybe someone wanted to hear about something that maybe you can talk about that. Go ahead. Can you talk louder? Okay, go. Is he okay now? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, the accidents happen like that. Actually, the Prophet ﷺ, he told us, this is the um, the adhkar of the morning and evening, right? And and you'll see it in Dabak, maybe you haven't made it part of your life, but the Prophet ﷺ, like you said about that, you know, say it ten times and so on, some of those things are authentic. And you can actually ask them for a du'a book here. I'm sure that the du'a books they have here are authentic. They're authentic ones that the Prophet ﷺ said. So for example, you'd wake up in the morning, morning and just like you get in the car and say, SubhanAllah, like that's authentic. The Prophet, it's in the Quran, in fact. And the Prophet would do it, and there are other ones like that. One, for example, that the Prophet taught us was, to say that three times after Fajr and after Asr. Bismillah, which means in the name of Allah, who who, um, you know, against nothing can happen except that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees. So anything bad that was planning to happen, if you make that dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you from those things. And actually, when I'm, when I get out in the morning and I, and I haven't said the dua and I'm actually getting in the car, sometimes I won't even like start the car until I finish saying these duas or try to say them quickly. And if I don't say them, I feel like, you know, I'm a, I'm a moving target for for something bad or either devils or jinns and so on 
Recently, there's been, I know you guys like these kind of things, Jin Possession, Exorcisms, you like that stuff? Zakalah. Jin Possession, Exorcism. Recently, there's been, um, you know, people phoning me up and saying, you know, I'm possessed by a jinn or, or someone in my family is possessed by a jinn, so can you help us? There's a lot of that stuff in Pakistan. Jinn Possession. Why do people in Pakistan get possessed by jinn so much? <coughs> okay, so so the first thing I'll tell them. Okay, so like a sister, they said we think she's possessed by a jinn. Can you you know tell us some surahs to recite? I said number one, she probably doesn't wear hijab, does she? They're like no, no, she doesn't, and she doesn't pray her five salah, and she goes no, she doesn't. And I said then why you want to read Quran for her? I go, she's not practicing Islam. In the first place, what's the Quran going to do for her? She doesn't believe in it. She's not practicing it. And that's why she's possessed in the first place. Because if she made her dua and she s sought the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you, when you get out of the house, these are all, when you say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan ar rajim you say, Oh Allah, protect me from the shaitan. If someone never says those things, then Allah's not protecting them actually from the shaitan. So it, the shaitans take over their lives. They take over their lives. And there's more to the jinn position, but what was this doing? Okay, this question is... Everybody paying attention? There are... There have been things that people have claimed in the Qur'an that tie 9-11 to the Muslims and Islam. Are they true? The, the stuff like subhanAllah, the first time I, I saw that, they're like, go to Surah 9, verse 11, and verse 111, and go here and there, or verse 911. And then, <coughs> it has nothing to do with <laughs> September 11th, actually. Even those verses that they're quoting, when I read it, I'm like, so? <laughs> you know, like, it, it has nothing to do with 9-11. With just, they just say, like, look, this verse has something to do with 9-11. And then the person's like, they never even thought twice about, hey, this verse actually has nothing to do with 9-11, but then they're like, wow, it does have. That's number one, it has nothing to do with 9-11. Number two is that this is the way of the Christians. This is the way of the Christians in that they they like to look for like these hidden meanings and these uh, numerology and, and try to find hidden meanings behind the numbers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never... It doesn't say in the Qur'an that search the Qur'an through its numerical um, secrets. No, nowhere it says in the Qur'an. And you'll see that maybe the same person who's so concerned about that verse, Surah 9, not verse 11, they've probably never read Surah 9. And that verse, they're not even looking at the meaning of it, maybe the ayah is before it or the ayah after it. The message is you know, slapping them in the face, the message of the Qur'an, and they're like, what does the hidden... you know? Um, superstitious meaning and they've never actually tried to seek out the the point blank meaning of the Quran and I grew up actually in this kind of an atmosphere in Canada we had a lot of kind of speakers that were they would always say you know why did Allah say this in the Quran it means this and they would like trying to find some hidden uh, deeper meanings and I thought to myself that nobody actually knows the apparent meaning in the first place when someone says, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Why look for a hidden meaning when you, the, the, the meaning on the top, on the surface, is there for everybody. Guide us to the straight path. It's just apparent. Why do you have to go to somewhere deeper and look at the numbers and there's seven verses in the Quran, that and go here, when they don't even know the apparent meaning. So you don't really have to worry about things like that. When you get an email like that, just delete it. And it won't bother you anymore, inshallah. <coughs> It says, can anyone see a jinn? Can anyone see a jinn? I don't know if you... Oh. There have been, um, like, you know, like I said, uh, exorcisms. There have been scholars. And actually, if you get Abdul Idris to, to talk to you, is Abdul Idris talking to them? To the youth? After this one? Okay. Well, as soon as he comes in, ask him this question. Because I think Abdul Idris has done exorcisms. So you get first-hand account of someone who's done an exorcism. 
So when he says any questions, don't sit quietly like you're sitting quietly. Say, Brother Abdullah, you know, Sheikh Abdullah, can you tell us about the exorcism that you did in Toronto? And then you get really excited, inshallah. So, so, I'll let you <laughs> so I'll let you ask him about that. He has done exorcism. I think he did it to maybe a sister, and he'll tell you what happened to her, or what happened during that, that exorcism. Any other questions? Okay, this question it says, how should we advise a friend who does not pray? Should we not be friends with them anymore? Okay, that's a good question, alhamdulillah, because sometimes we think when someone's doing something bad, the only way to show our Islam, that we're following Islam is to treat them badly and this is incorrect because sometimes like in the end we want that person to start praying for example right? we want the person to start praying so you look at what happened like you imagine to yourself here we are you know this is Farzana and this is Sister Homa Homa wants Farzana to pray her Salah and then she, she imagines you know five months in the future you want to cut me off? <laughs> okay, inshallah. So, like we said, Homa is talking to Farzana. She wants Farzana to pray. She thinks to five months into the future, Farzana is wearing hijab and she's praying her five salah and she's a very good Muslim. Now, if you're in that, you know, think of that future and then work your way back and think what happened for her to get into this situation. You say, for example, you know, I took her out for pizza and then she became you know good friends with the sisters in the masjid and we invited her to the halakha then she came to the halakha and she herself without being told she started praying with us and then later on you know she started praying at home she felt that it made a change in her life and then later on five months later she started praying okay so that might be you know your blueprint for success if you and do like this for example, should we not be friends with them anymore? Here's Rosanna, here's Homa. It can either go up in a positive way or it can go down in a negative way. If for example you say, oh you don't pray, you must not be a uh, Muslim. Brother Muhammad said that people who don't pray aren't Muslim. And he didn't really understand what I said. But And then so she's like, what do you mean not Muslim? You know, And she might have like major problems in her, in her aqidah. She gets mad at that, she's insulted. Later on, someone says, let's go later on today to the next lecture. And she's like, I don't care about what Abdul Ladri says. You know, someone said that I don't pray and I don't want to come back anymore. So she's like, let's just go to the shopping center. She goes to the shopping center. She buys like maybe haram clothes and then everything gets bad after that. And it just goes down the hill. So by actually getting angry at her and cutting her off, you may have led her to misguidance. You know, so you look at what can I do for her to help her to be a good Muslim. And the question I would always have is, if you have a camel and you have a donkey, this is always like an Arabic uh, saying, they say that if the camel hangs out with the donkey for a long time, the camel will start sounding like a donkey. <laughs> so I thought to myself, I go, well, why doesn't the donkey start sounding like a camel? The camel is supposed to be the good one in this thing. And subhanAllah, it seems that a lot of times it's the person with the evil that is more stronger than the person who's who's good. This person wants to go to the masjid and pray, and this other guy wants to, you know, go driving around in his car and go to a beach somewhere and have fun and and do things. Obviously, that guy's gonna win out, right? Because these things are uh, supposedly unfun, right? But you have to you have to work hard to be strong. So if you are being good to her and befriending her, you have to make sure that 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 goodness is stronger than maybe the evil impulses that she'll give. Alright, inshallah, we're going to uh, close now. Like I said, tell me what happens with uh, Sheikh Abdullah.